Welcome back to our conference, Bulgaria on the European FinTech map. Today, I'm joined uh, in this panel discussion uh, with my colleague and dear friend, um, Dejan Radev. Uh, he's a, uh, a system professor, an assistant professor at Sofia University. He is actually our uh, core person uh, within the Sofia University. He's the guy who is dealing with, um, with FinTech and e-banking course. In, uh, in the FinTech master degree that we have with the Faculty of Economics and Business Administration at Sofia University. And um, just a bit of a perspective for him, uh, of some bi uh, bio from him. Um, he has been teaching finance for more than 10 years uh, in Germany, in Frankfurt and Bonn. And uh, he recently actually came back to Bulgaria uh, about a year and a half when uh, we started the master degree. So, Dejan, thank you for being here. Thank you for, for taking the time uh, and uh, joining me. Thank you for inviting me. He's actually the uh, main person behind the so-called financial analysis that we do uh, with our, um, within our uh, report. And uh, he's the, let's say, it's the, the professional sides uh, when we are talking about finances. But before we start the, uh, the discussion here with him, um, I just wanted to give you uh, another perspective on who we are, uh, what we do, um, and then only then to deep dive in the uh, report. Uh, namely, we will uh, cover uh, first who we are, and then uh, the mapping that we have uh, prepared and created with Innovative Sofia, and then uh, we move forward to to the financial analysis and this annual fintech report that uh, that we released today. So, uh, just like I mentioned already, uh, Bulgarian fintech association is a cluster organization gathering in one place public, private, and academia sectors. Um, we at this very moment we have 59 member companies, including two universities, and excluding their employees, we represent more than 7,400 employed in the digital finance sector. We are also a co-founder of the European Digital Finance Association and an affiliate member to the International Financial Education Network, to OECD. And the very last thing that I just mentioned is related to the um, fintech education uh, sides of, of our work within uh, the association that we will, we will discuss a bit, a bit later. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, really, we... Uh, have five main points um, to to tackle uh, and to work as a cluster organization. From uh, from like the first, the very first point is to bring together of uh, of the fintech uh, fintech community uh, in Bulgaria in one place to make them talk, to make them talk business, uh, to to form new partnerships and so on, and only then um, to start discussing on regulation, uh, both on national and supranational level. And that's actually our second goal uh, about representing the industry's interests before regulators. Once again, um, on both national and supranational level, meaning before the Bulgarian uh, national authorities and the European ones. Uh, then we have uh, we've been we've been showcasing fintech um, fintechs in front of our, our partners, whether they're from uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, or uh, anywhere in the world, because uh, they're all interested in, in our ecosystem. Uh, this is what what we give them uh, our our members to uh, really to have this opportunity to talk and to meet with uh, with the global fintech. Um, Last but not least, uh, by importance is, of course, uh, to establish our uh, country as a, a leading fintech hub. Uh, of course, including um, the, the work on uh, promoting fintech education. We also have another project in attracting Bulgarian uh, diaspora, but we will leave it uh, for a bit later uh, because uh, we still have to, to work on it and to give proper, proper results on it, but we are on it, that's for sure. So why Bulgaria? Why actually do we have FinTech uh, at the first place? You see some of the main metrics here. Um, 
but according to us, you know, it's all about quality of IT personnel. Okay, we also have really nice infrastructure with the uh, fastest mobile internet speed in Europe, um, really nice business climate with only 10% of corporate income tax, but uh, what is in our heart and what we do believe is the most important is the um, quality of IT personnel. Namely, here we have two main uh, metrics. We have been ranked 12th among the countries with the best developers in the world, and we are first in Europe when it comes to IT certified specialists per capita. So these are the prerequisites, the conditions, why do we have FinTech at all? And now we start with the report. This is the report on the right uh, side, you see it. Um, we are still about to, um, to publish the, the physical one, the physical report. You can have the digital one already on, uh, from our website. It's already there, so you can um, download it for free. So this is what, uh, on the left with the list, uh, this is what we will find within the report. And actually, most of these topics will be covered on today's conference. We have, uh, first of all, a, a mapping of our ecosystem. We have uh, another uh, um, fintech market analysis, um, all of these initiatives uh, and key stakeholders uh, for the financial education uh, section. Uh, we also cover um, the, the so we call it Southeast Europe fintech landscape, or we put Bulgaria on the map and compare it to all of our neighbors, uh, Greece, North Macedonia, Serbia, uh, all of these neighboring countries of ours. Then we have uh, another, another really important topic on uh, fintech destination. Why Bulgaria is considered fintech destination and who actually is, uh, are these key stakeholders that could help a foreign company to come to Bulgaria. Namely, here we have Invest Bulgaria mm -hmm. Agency and uh, some, other, some other players that are having articles. The next thing uh, is about in the next panel and the ne next, ne next session in the report is about fintech investments, um, who has done what in the last uh, couple of years, and of course we cover regulation parts that we have discussed uh, later today. Uh, in the very uh, end of the um, of the report, we cover the technologies in fintech. Namely, here we have artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, uh, open finance. Why these? Why these things are so important to our um, to our industry? And in the end, what we want to do and what we want to achieve is to present the development of our of our industry and of our sector. So um, before we continue with the discussion with, uh, with Dayan here. I just wanted to show you, uh, just to give you a glimpse on uh, the first, what is actually a FinTech? Uh, and probably most of you already know this, but uh, just to point it out and to stress it out uh, in the very beginning, we have from one side finance and technology does that that's, uh, gathering together, uh, forming all sorts of business models. Here you, you see a taxonomy coming from uh, the University of Cambridge and their uh, Center for um, Alternative Finance. And uh, this is a, a flywheel with all the business models that's, that are potentially out there creating, innovating uh, the finance sector. So um, we also take in consideration uh, the main definitions about fintech. But in the, in, within our association, uh, in BFA, uh, we think about, when we talk about fintech, we, uh, we mean uh, all, uh, all of these new business models that, and approaches, products, services uh, that remodel the a common understanding of uh, finance and financial and banking services. So taking all of these that I just that, that I just mentioned, the, the taxonomy, the, um, which is basically our methodology to come up to, to this uh, fintech mapping, uh, this is what we created together once again with Innovative Sofia. On the top part, uh, you see all of the fintech companies here within uh, our region, uh, meaning that uh, they're not only Bulgarian companies, there are some FDIs, foreign direct investments, but these are all the companies that, uh, that are working from Bulgaria, uh, whether it's for the Bulgarian market or uh, somewhere abroad, uh, it doesn't matter. We have it here because they're part of our ecosystem. We also have on the top right corner, we have the fintech supporting companies. These are some companies that are 
obviously supporting fintech, but uh, there most of them they're IT development companies. They're not. They don't really have so many um, fintech products within their portfolio, but they're still uh, an essential part of the fintech ecosystem. Uh, and the bottom part is the uh, part that is uh, that is important by no means. Um, that is n that is really really more important. Um, just because it, it is the very foundation that we need uh, for have a uh, ecosystem, a fintech ecosystem thriving. Namely, here we have the entrepreneurial ecosystem. In the uh, in the very middle, you see the regulators. Uh, you just uh, so and probably you will see. Sorry, you will see uh, just a bit later one of our regulators joining the conference, um, the Financial Supervision Commission, the reg regulator in the non-banking sector. So all of these players, they're really important. They're, they're really part of. of the ecosystem and we work with them in order to develop it further to develop further the ecosystem okay um, the, the whole report the, the report once again is already available on our websites um, the mapping uh, the mapping as well so you just go to our website go to the news section and you'll find it there now we proceed with uh, the uh, more more interesting part, at least that's that's more uh, that's my object, that's my perspe perspective here. This is the um, now the release of annual fintech report 2021. So we start first with the uh, industry composition. Uh, what we have found that in Bulgaria, according to the taxonomy, uh, the University of Cambridge taxonomy, uh, that excludes uh, and I have to mention and stress on this that excludes banks. Um, so we in Bulgaria we found uh, 135 um, fintech companies, and out of these 135, uh, more than 90 percent of them are SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Something really nice, something really important, because it shows that our uh, ecosystem is um, is probably uh, is just really flexible. So hopefully we will see um, more and more, more, more and more uh, SMEs coming uh, in the next, next years as well. But we have to mention that most of them are um, with headquarters and based in, in Sofia, uh, namely uh, 115 uh, out of 125 that, that I just mentioned in, uh, earlier. Uh, so more than about 90% are based in Sofia, and we have a couple of nice examples from Varna Plovdiv uh, and um, some other uh, some other cities uh, such as uh, Pazarjik. We um, I believe there was another one. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, somewhere else, um, it was Tarazagora, yes, Tarazagora, and um, ex actually all around the country. But uh, we have to once again uh, put it here. Um, they're not. They're not so many, unfortunately. Most of them are based in Sofia. So the the dynamic of of the market. This is what uh, that this is what we have d done, just to actually map uh, and see when when are these uh, 135 companies when they were created when they were established. So as you see, uh, we have a peak in uh, in 2018. Uh, and it was something really nice to, to point it out that uh, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, um, in 2020 we have uh, 18 companies that were fintech companies that were uh, established. So what we can observe and uh, really speculate because it's not uh, uh, already the end of the year, but uh, in 2021 we see kind of a delay um, uh, when we're talking about uh, creation of, of fintechs. And probably that's, that's uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have to discuss it and to analyze it further, but uh, we need the data first. So let's, let's wait for, uh, for the end of the year and then we can um, talk about it once again. 135 fintech companies, just like I mentioned, uh, here you can see um, uh, segmented uh, of these companies um, by, by, by categories. Um, and as you can see, the very first and the biggest uh, segment that is obvious from the um, mapping as well is the digital finance sector with 44 uh, fintech companies. But now, about the market analysis that we do. Uh, we take in consideration total revenue, and uh, we actually took the uh, took um, the market uh, the total revenue for 
six years back from now, from, from 2020, because this is the very latest data that we can acquire. And actually how we acquired it, we actually got all these data from uh, our uh, commercial register. So this, is, this data is publicly available out there. So we basically took, um, took the uh, fintech companies that we have, that we listed already, and uh, we just uh, took, took their uh, financial, uh, financial data. So we see uh, a, an average growth of about 20%, 21% in the last six years and um, kind of a positive effect of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and now I'm uh, giving here the floor uh, after this uh, lengthy monologue uh, to to the end, uh, how do you see this, uh, this, this growth? Uh, what is really the impact of uh, COVID-19 or, and how we can interpret this, uh, this number actually? So uh, thank you once again for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to work on the financial report more hands-on. And what we see here is uh, basically the impact of the new companies that were incorporated in 2020. And obviously, uh, there, there is some delay uh, in 2019, but then it picks up again and there is a return to the previous growth path. And in my opinion, maybe 2020 and 2021 would be the toughest years for the market and for the fintech segment. And then we'll see an even higher acceleration in the growth in the coming years. So in the next figures, if we compare, uh, we see operating revenue and we see that it plateaus a bit uh, in the last several years. And what operating revenue is, that's basically the revenue from the core business of the fintech companies. And in the previous graph, we saw an increase of about 400 million level and in total revenue. And in operating revenue, it was a bit flat. And what that hints at is that basically our fintech companies are very industrious and use, manage to use their uh, financial acumen and managerial acumen to identify profitable opportunities in their non-core operations. This, what we see now is the core business and the difference to total revenues, the non-core business. All right, good. Um, and uh, the second, sorry, uh, another, another graph that we have here, a, part, a pie chart, Operating revenue by segment. Uh, we already mentioned it, but the biggest segment uh, within our, our map um, is the so-called digital payments. Uh, so all of these firms that are uh, related to, um, to e-money e license and so on and so forth, uh, actually they produced 66% of the operating revenue in 2020. What is your take on this? Is that good or probably th there is a risk uh, behind it. So actually that, that is a very, very interesting result and uh, it points out uh, to the differences uh, between the business models of payment uh, companies and the rest of the fintech companies. And the payment companies uh, basically focus on their core operations, especially during crisis. And you could also see, uh, hear it from our guest lecturers at the, at the course. Uh, the, pay, the representatives of payment companies were talking about their core values and sticking to their core values, uh, knowing who you are, while the other participants from uh, the other parts that, that you see here, they were talking about identifying new opportunities, finding niches, and, and that, that was quite interesting to see it uh, in the data, what they were, and they were basically sticking to, to what they were saying, they were actually doing it. So what we see here is in operating revenue, those big payment companies are representing most of it, but in 
maybe in the next figures we'll see a bit of a reshuffling where it's made more obvious the top five performers, performers, how they behave. Yeah, but before we go to, to the top five performance, I wanted to discuss the total assets as well, because it is really um, nice to see that, uh, and from my perspective, it's um, actually impressive that even during the pandemic, uh, despite actually the pandemic, we see an increase of about 20% in total assets. Um, and of course, if we uh, compare this to, uh, to 2015, the, the total assets that we see, it's, it doubles actually. But uh, why do you think the, the total assets are, are, are increasing during, even during the pandemic? So the more obvious reason is that quite a few new companies were established, so they added up to the total assets in the segment. But also, uh, many of the established, and we'll s see it in the next panels later on in the day, many of the established players received uh, venture capital or other capital injections. And what we actually can deduce from this graph is that investors believe in the fintech companies, either in new projects that uh, inter entrepreneurs are uh, presenting and suggesting to them, or uh, they continue to support uh, the more established players. Great. Uh, now we move uh, forward to the best performers. And uh, here we have two graphs. Uh, the first one is the um, fintech companies, the top five fintech companies uh, by total revenue. And we also have uh, top five fintech companies by operating revenue uh, for 2020 once again. So namely here we have uh, on, uh, in bold graphs uh, on the very first place Datex. Uh, then we have uh, the very second is the, the second is Paysafe. Uh, and then we have a slight change, um, MyPost and Experian. Uh, and uh, Easy Payments is on the fourth place when talking about um, total revenue. And you see, uh, you see the rest. Um, but how can you comment on this? What is, what is your take on, on that? So sort of? that goes back to my argument about the core and non-core business. The, one, the, the graph to the right shows that well, the, the, bigger, the biggest fintech company, Datex, remains on the top compared to, well, it remains on the top to the left. Uh, then we continue with uh, a big player in the payments segment and a big international player on the credit scoring and support for credit uh, institutions. And if we compare both graphs and, and the bars that are for those three companies, we see that there is not such a big difference between the total revenue and the operating revenue. And that means that during, uh, yes, that's 2020, during the crisis, they really focused and they had really robust business. Uh, while my polls and easy pay, you see that in the case of my polls, it increased maybe by 50, 70 percent from operating to total revenue. So they have uh, huge non-core operations, which uh, as it goes back to my argument about financial decisions, management, managerial decisions to take advantage during the crisis. But it also points out to maybe new venues of uh, operations and uh, some of those operations might divest and uh, boost again the number of new companies. And another thing that we should mention here is that it's a bit difficult to pin down what the core business in Bulgaria is of a company. We, we had discussions even how to define what fintech is. They were listed in different segments, but they were obviously financial, uh, financial, financial technological companies. So in, if those definitions change, I guess it has to be in the law. I think it will be, th those figures will be closer to, to the one on the left. Right, so many things are about to change in the, in the next years. Um, 
And now we have another great, great uh, graphic. It's about the top five most dynamic fintechs. We see an average of the re re revenue, uh, operating revenue of about 30%. And actually, Cashwave, uh, which I'm proud to say is a part of our association, actually the, with the fastest growth in the last three years. So um, seeing these, these companies, um, actually we can uh, conclude that um, most of them, they're FDIs, they're foreign direct investments, meaning um, companies coming from abroad, investing in our ecosystem and um, going, going outside of, of, our, um, of our jurisdiction. Um, how, how do you comment this? I mean, what's, what do you think about, uh, in specific about this, and how important is is to have uh, the foreign direct di so foreign direct investments in in Bulgaria? So what I see here um, brings the uh, comparison of one of our lecturers in the course. Uh, he was explaining how the payments segment became so important historically in Bulgaria. And basically those foreign investors entered the market because they outsourced their technical support here. So what I see here is the value of the IT sector in Bulgaria and also quite interestingly when people Google those companies they'll see that they're uh, well, our teams in Bulgaria basically support invest, uh, in companies that help uh, the world to invest. And what we see for 2020, this spike uh, that continued growth, uh, is, uh, it reflects the, uh, well, the fact that many people with savings during the crisis realize that they have to put them in some safe assets. They start, have to start reading about investing and start investing. And I, I won't uh, mention some, some of uh, the financial advice that I had to give, but really it picked up whether you would invest in gold or uh, in, bo in Bitcoin, or cryptocurrencies or Tesla, technological companies. It should all go through maybe our tech centers here for Bulgaria, and that's what we see. Right, so um, just in a word or a sentence, we might conclude that Bulgaria is a great place to be, a great fintech center, right? Exactly. And having all of these conditions, um, you already mentioned them, IT and so on, it's, it's a great place to, for growth, right? So um, another, another important part, about expenses, because uh, we already heard the inflation coming, um, but uh, these are the data for last year, for 2020. Uh, we see another another peak, actually, uh, and um, an average pace of 24% uh, uh, when we're talking about total expenses, meaning um, uh, what are the expenses and uh, what are the, the consum what is the consumption of, of the fintech companies. Um, but during the, pand the pandemic, uh, we also see another, uh, another important part here, uh, that expenses increased, right? So uh, how, do you, how do you really interpret this? So th those are the total expenses for the whole sector. So here again, we see basically the new companies entering the market. Maybe some of the others reduce their expenses, but those that started operating during 2020, they, they started uh, having costs. And basically that is what we see here. And we'll see on the next graph where most of those expenses go to. Uh, those are personnel costs. So we have uh, an increase of May from 2019 to 2020 of, let's say, 80 million. And the increase in uh, total expenses from the previous graph were 120. So 66% of those 120 million were for personnel. And obviously those new companies are hiring new personnel. They had to endow them with capital. But uh, it, 
maybe most of those costs will plateau at some point where, when uh, the onboarding process uh, finishes in, in most of those com country, uh, companies. And yes, we'll, we'll see in, in other graphs a bit more on that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when talking about uh, personnel, we have to mention also uh, the workforce. I mean, how many people are, uh, are working within the sector, uh, within the industry? Uh, so what we see here is that about 9,000 people are employed in the digital finance sector of Bulgaria, uh, and there is a steady growth of 14% per year uh, on average. Uh, and the last two years, um, including 2020 with the pandemic, with the, with the start of the pandemic, we see kind of a slowed down uh, increase. The, the pace uh, slows down by about 50%, actually more than 50%. Why do you think this happens? So this here is maybe due to the small size of the new companies that were established. Most of the established companies uh, from my talks with representatives have tried to keep their personnel so there was no not huge decrease from them the new companies hired new personnel and we also see here maybe the competition for for this talent for technological talent because everyone is looking for that not only in bulgaria there are other technological segments uh, in, in the Bulgarian economy, and everyone is looking basically for the same similar kinds of skill set, uh, but also the whole world is looking for that. So we'll see our competitive advantages on a couple of slides later, but I, I attribute this to uh, the slow growth to, to the pandemic and to competition. Right. So I totally agree with you and stand behind this, this opinion. And from my personal perspective here, I would mention only that uh, we see these loads uh, growth um, and we have to, um, to get back to this graph next year as well and see, did we really achieve the, the, the top? Uh, like, did we achieve the peak that we can, that we can achieve within our ecosystem, within our uh, jurisdiction? Are we uh, already running out of IT personnel and not only IT because you see um, uh, what are the other um, positions um, employed in the sector? But this is an open question uh, that we will hopefully answer next year and uh, the years to come. Uh, the total revenue per employee, we see there was a, a a significant spike in 20, uh, 2018, uh, meaning actually this total revenue, um, we, can, we can attribute it to the productivity of, of employees in the sector. But um, Dejan, uh, how do you find this, these numbers? So uh, as you said, the, the, that is a proxy, a crude proxy about the productivity per employee. And we, we can mention the crisis here, but I think what's uh, more relevant is uh, that huge number of companies that were, again, I mentioned it, established during uh, 2020, and they hired 450, 500 new people, and those people had, had to be onboarded. So obviously they have not yet reached their full revenue potential, I expect this to rise, or maybe higher than the peak, but 123,000 per year per employee, it, it still it, it looks good, even if it stays at that level. Definitely, that, that's correct. Okay, um, another, uh, another great uh, finding, I would say. Um, so during the year, uh, in 2021, we conducted a market, uh, market research, uh, a market analysis uh, with a survey, um, in not only in our association, but for the whole ecosystem. So based on uh, 21 replies from fintech representatives, uh, meaning that about one-fifth of the whole uh, ecosystem, one-sixth of the whole ecosystem answered, uh, and based on their uh, replies, based on their HR replies, it turns out that the, the average fintech gross salary is 
two, time, two times, more than two times, two times and a half, uh, the average Bulgarian gross, gross salary. Um, Dan, why do you think we have such, such great numbers? Well, again, we, we talk about a very highly skilled personnel here, obviously higher than the average for the country. And it's nice to see that it is, uh, this personnel is being remunerated. So the fintech companies are valuing and, try, and obviously trying to keep that personnel. In the report, you will see the dynamics since 2015, uh, how quickly the salaries have increased. We also saw it in other graphs, uh, previous graphs, that most of the costs in, during the crisis were to remunerate employees, especially uh, mentioning, uh, I already mentioned the competition for, for, those, uh, for this highly skilled labor. And so I see here the uh, convergence to, because of competition, convergence to Western European salaries. And here we have to mention the, uh, the gross salary is, okay, let's say 2,000 euro. The net salary is 1,500, 600. Uh, if we compare to the big financial centers, London, Paris, Frankfurt, uh, in Bulgaria, that kind of money buys you four times more. So the purchasing power is four times higher in Bulgaria. And if you in Sofia, if you have 1,600 net, uh, in Frankfurt, you should have more than 6,000 net. And I, I've lived there 10 years. I can tell you that very few people earn 6,000 net in Frankfurt. And yeah, that if you look at the absolute numbers, uh, we still have to catch up. But if you put it in perspective, uh, uh, we, you, you talked about the infrastructure, the conditions here, the fact that we are much to the south of London and Frankfurt. I think we have a really nice opportunities and environment here, and we should market it more. And we should, I think, open to foreign talent. We saw that, yeah, there, there is a need on the market. Right, totally agree with this. And if I have to conclude this, uh, this slide here uh, for all of the audience that are watching now, uh, we could simply say that for all of you guys that are considering joining uh, the ecosystem, um, it turns out that it's been paid pretty nice, pretty, pretty good uh, in, our, in our industry. So why not? Why not joining it? Why not uh, specializing in um, in this this very direction? And uh, the perfect place and perfect uh, way to do it is uh, through a master degree that we have together with Sofia University. This was just a, f a small ad here from my side. Uh, we will mention it once again uh, in the discussions. Uh, but uh, just keep in mind that uh, it's a nice place to be. That's for sure. And. Uh, Another uh, another graph um, here about about market demand. What are exact uh, what are exactly the uh, positions? What are the the roles that are uh, most in demand? And um, I guess it's it's no surprise that engineers uh, and project managers, as well as data scientists, are are in the top, right? Yes. So. That again goes back to our previous discussions. Uh, in tech companies, obviously, we we'll, uh, we'll search for IT IT engineers. Uh, also, data scientists, obviously, project managers who are in the know how to to talk to tech guys and to the sales teams. And what we can say here is we can talk about the deficiencies that there is a uh, deficit for those particular employees every, uh, as I said every tech company not only the fint uh, fintech companies look for those people but at the same time uh, you will see it in the next panels about financial education and uh, more general education that uh, the private 
uh, schools, uh, uh, soft uh, IT schools, and also the universities are trying to retrain the existing uh, labor force. Uh, the Bulgarian economy is going through a huge structural change at the moment, especially of the la uh, labor force. So while there are always going to be a deficit on that, uh, there will definitely be more people employed. To, going back to, to what you, you said earlier, whether there is, whether we reach but to no, I think that. Uh, and we see it in our master's programs. Uh, there are also at the technical universities, other universities will be represented here. That also the labor force is actively trying to, uh, to, re to learn new skills because the numbers don't lie to, to times higher salary than, than the average in the country. All right, so it's uh, more about uh, the numbers, the numbers here. Um, so this is our next topic and our next panel, uh, Women in Fintech. We now conclude here uh, and we just put a full stop by uh, wrapping it up, saying that uh, our industry is uh, really thriving. We have uh, 125 Fintech companies. Only in the last year, uh, in 2020, about 20 were created. Um, what uh, we uh, heard from uh, from Valeri earlier that uh, there there really um, a lot of investments, but we will discuss it a bit later. So meaning that uh, there is more and more um, attention to our sector. We see that um, the companies uh, they're paying really good uh, salaries to to their employees. So uh, it is a nice start for um, for any person, I believe. What, how would you like to, to conclude this, this part, Dejan? What we saw is that the fintech sector is resilient to, to the crisis. Uh, obviously, new companies were uh, established, uh, new personnel was hired, and that's what I heard also from our guest lecturers. And I do believe that crisis well, I've built a career on studying financial crisis, and I know that more are to come. So that's, that's a guarantee. And those who, obviously, our fintech sector survived it and thrived during the crisis, and that will be an amazing, an amazing life and professional experience to the future managers and entrepreneurs in the fintech sector. So I, I see only good things in those numbers and in that report. All right, thank you so much for uh, for having you, to, for being here, really. Uh, and really, thank you for, for joining our, our efforts uh, for the reports. And it was a great pleasure. We'll continue to work together, uh, both on the master's degree and all other projects coming, as well as the FinTech Hackathon that we mentioned uh, a bit later. Uh, so we now uh, proceed with, with, another, um, with another panel of ours. But let's have a uh, first a quick break just to catch catch a breath uh, and uh, see you in 10 minutes thank you so thank much you.